Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to the first session of the seminar, uh, Simon Don Imagination and Invention, uh, with our instructor, Cecil Mospina. Uh, this survey seminar will offer students of the new center a collaborative close reading uh, of the recently published English translation by Joe Hugh and Christophe Romana of Gilbert Simon Don's seminal work, Imagination and Invention. Uh, it is a lecture series de de delivered by Simon Don at the Sorbonne's uh, Institute of Psychology in 1965-66, and it offers a profound, uh, a profound organi reorganization of the basic concepts uh, of the relation between imaginative processes and inventive practices prevalent in psychology and philosophy. It is a special privilege to welcome two guest speakers uh, for this seminar, Andrea Zopis and Andrea Bargain. Uh, Zopis' se session will provide invaluable philosophical context by situating Simondon's work uh, on the imagination vis-a-vis -vis two key contemporaries, uh, Michael Dufresne and uh, François Lyotard. Uh, Bardin, on the other hand, will enrich the seminar with a critical comparison of Simondon's uh, book and almost homonymous 1962-63 uh, lecture at Sorbonne, uh, which is called Imagination. Uh, by uh, Juliette Favez uh, Favre Boutonnier. Uh, this seminar will delve into Simon Don's concept of the image object, emphasizing uh, the multifaceted uh, role in syn synthesizing uh, contemporary re realities and social norms. In Imagination and Invention, Simon Don posits uh, that the image serves as a pivotal mediator between uh, subjective experience and objective truths. Uh, enabling a dynamic interaction between the concrete and the abstract. We'll discuss the dual nature of both uh, of images as both mental constructs and tangible ob uh, artifacts, their significance in memory and foresight, and their influence on decision-making and cultural expression. By analyzing Simon Don's uh, approach to the proliferation and mediation of images, participants will gain a novel perspective on how the imagination drives invention and shapes human experience. This seminar provides a comprehensive overview of Simon Don's theories and a refined understanding of what Simon Don uh, took to be the vital uh, role of both imagination and invention in various domains of life. This close reading of imagination and invention will uh, enable students of the new center to familiarize themselves with the core arguments and to clarify key concepts. By situating this work within its historical and philosophical context, this close reading will also position Simon Don's ideas with respect to other philosophical theories uh, and enable us to reflect together on their ethical and practical implications. Students will actively engage uh, in discussions, presentations, and uh, their final written visual or sound assignment. Uh, honing their critical thinking and communication skills. They'll be encouraged to extrapolate from Simon Don's insights to the mediating uh, role of images between subjective and objective realms in order to think about contemporary issues relevant to the arts, but also to recent developments in the theory of evolution of uh, cognitive processes and intelligence. Simon Don's concept of pl plurifunctionality uh, of images notably will offer an original angle on current inquiries into the neural activity and cognitive uh, development, but also uh, artificial intelligence and the widely accepted analogy between AI and human image processing and imaginative capabilities. Uh, by integrating Simon Don's philosophical insights with contemporary techno aesthetic and techno scientific theories, this seminar fosters original thinking with respect to the intricate relationships between imagination, cognition, and technological innovation. Cecil Malaspina is the author of An Epistemology of Noise and principal translator of Simon Don's uh, On the Mode of Existence of Technical Objects. Uh, she's the directrice de programme uh, at the Collège International de Philosophie uh, in Paris and visiting research fellow of uh, King's College London and the University of West of England, where her program for the uh, Collège is hosted by the departments of French and philosophy, respectively. She is contributing uh, editor for uh, Angelaki Journal of uh, Theoretical Humanities, a commissioning editor for the independent publisher Copy Press and guest editor at Nature, Humanities and uh, Social Sciences Communication. S Cecil Malspina obtained her doctorate in epistemology, philosophy and history of the sciences uh, and technology from uh, Paris 7, uh, Denis Diderot, and her master's in contemporary French philosophy and critical theory from the uh, Center for Research in Modern European Philosophy in the UK. Before turning to philosophy, she trained as an artist, art historian in Goldsmiths, and uh, 
as curator in uh, RCA. Humane interest uh, lies in the normativity of concepts, especially with regard to the aesthetic and ethical implications of conceptualizing contingency and uncertainty. Cecile, please take it away. Thank you very much, Mr. Slav, and uh, it's a great pleasure to see you again. It's a great pleasure to see uh, many new faces and uh, a small number of familiar people. I was wondering before we start, um, how many of you were part of the Simondon seminar on information? Um, I can see a, a couple of you, yeah. <laughs> uh, Peggy is here and uh, Kemal and... Okay, so I, I recognize a few of you, but not everyone. So uh, we're going to do introductions after I do a little presentation. This is for the um, archiving of the first session, uh, so that I'm going to start with uh, an uh, as yet unpublished essay, or rather it's a, it, it's a, the kind of notes uh, that will go into this um, article and that I'm sharing with you here. Uh, just to get you into the mood of uh, why, other than for a kind of curiosity of the history of philosophy, why I think Simon Dorn still has some kind of explosive contemporary relevance uh, today. The introduction to the course sounded very grandiose, all the different things we're going to do, but in a way what we're going to do is relatively simple. We're going to read this book, uh, Imagination and Invention, um, slowly and carefully, part by part. And we're going to have two guest speakers who will give us a very well-researched, in-depth um, adventures into the kind of context of the history of philosophy so that we can contextualize in his own time Simon Dan's work. One of the, I say it's simple, and at the same time, it's not simple. Um, almost every philosopher I meet who, for example, has knows about Simon Don through Deleuze or um, has heard about Simon Don uh, tells me, oh, um, I haven't gotten around to Simon Don yet, A, eh? <laughs> because he's often considered to be simply an influence on Deleuze. Um, and B, those who did say, I really don't know uh, what hit me when I tried to read him, but it's it's not easy to read. And one of the reasons he's not easy to read is that uh, Simon Don has two, I would say, almost paradoxical uh, tendencies in his work. One is that of a sweeping um, generalization of, a, of, of what he calls the principle, well, he doesn't call it the principle of individuation, but he, he looks at what individuation could be when looked at through the contemporary sciences and technology. And so on the one hand, you have this drive to generalize the problem of individuation as something that you encounter in analogous forms throughout the different phenomena that we um, experience. And on the other hand, and thankfully, he goes into really the very close reading of um, scientific problem, the scientific problems of his time. So we need to do the same for us because the, the formulation of the scientific, technological, artistic uh, problematics that we encounter matter. The singularity of them matters. Um, one without the other becomes a form of um, almost idealism. And, and so you, yeah, you need to um, grapple with these two aspects. So it sounds, I don't want to sound, make it sound too simple, but I think simply reading imagination and invention, working through it gently, knowing that we can um, then contextualize it in his wider work and in his own moment of uh, the history of philosophy and the history of science and technology, but also making it relevant, not only to what's going on today, but this is something we're going to discuss later when each of you get a chance to introduce yourselves. Uh, there's really no point in reading. I mean, it's of course, it's nice. You can read Simon Dan. He's, I think he's amazing. He's interesting. This is an especially beautiful book to read, actually. But I think really why we read philosophers is to understand what kind of key they are to the problems we engage with in our own practices. So I'm, I'm very, it's very important for me to know what kind of practice or um theoretical engagements you bring into this. You don't need to have a philosophy background. Um, this is one of the wonderful things about the new Center for Research and Practice is that people come from um, a wide variety of different backgrounds 
illuminating differently the philosophical problems we talk about. And also, and this is quite important to me from different levels of engagement with this kind of text. So I don't need, I don't expect anyone to be, um, you know, fluent in reading Hegel or something like this. You, you can uh, bring your own practices of reading. I'm a very, very slow reader, for instance. I think that's not necessarily a bad thing. It's very annoying when you're in a hurry, but um, each of you will have their own way of textual engagement and your own um, development in terms of writing. So I, I hope really that by the end of, of the first session already, even the quietest among you will feel comfortable to chip in. To um, You don't need to feel that you have to have a fully formulated commentary or question um, even just an impulse. I think it, the most important thing is that we talk together and that you bring your practice into this so that um, Simon Dan is illuminated by the contemporary problematics that we encounter together, which are essentially you know, the work that you bring to this. So I'm going to start. Um, I don't do PowerPoints unless someone holds a gun to my head. Uh, so I'm going to share my screen when I read a long quote so that you don't get completely lost. Um, but I want you to use your imagination. If you need to, close your eyes. I'll try and read very slowly and not rush through things. Um, and this uh, first presentation is me trying to think about contemporary debates surrounding so-called artificial intelligence and how they challenge us to reconsider what is intelligent among the things we are capable of ourselves or not. And uh, to and to steer away in a way, use Simon Don to steer away from the dichotomy uh, that is often presented in the question whether AI is intelligent or stupid, or whether ChatGPT is uh, the forerunner to a kind of hyper intelligence that will make us uh, totally obsolete, or whether actually it's completely stupid and it's going to make the world stupid and us stupid. So I want to find a completely different way of thinking about the technologies we invent, the act of invention itself is something that is critical to understanding these technologies. And also to think with Simon Don why it matters so much what we imagine intelligence to be. And this, so I'm not going to say too much ahead of this. I'm going to start reading. It should only take about um, half an hour roughly. Uh, then we can do some question and answers and then a little break and then introductions and we can start talking about um, the other sessions, uh, the writing the essays, uh, everybody signing up for presentations on the texts, on the chapters that we'll be reading and on the texts that our guest speakers will share with us. While I start um, reading my text, I, Mrs. Love, if you could kindly share with everyone the sign up sheet. Um, it's quite important to me that we don't end up at the end of the seminar with everybody trying to do their presentations or then uh, not getting a chance to share your presentation with others and sending in recordings because one of the most beautiful aspects of, of these uh, seminars, I think, is your own readings and the discussions that we all have together. So if we can, you know, if you can start already signing up for your presentations, that would be really cool. These presentations, for those of you who haven't done them before, are um, 10 to 20 minutes long, depending on how many people sign up, that, that will kind of determine how much time we have for them. You can um, meet on the Discord channel and decide to team up with somebody else uh, who wants to work on the same text. So you can be um, two people presenting the same text, sometimes three people presenting the same text, um, and the way you present it is really creatively left to yourself. So having said this, I'm going to start now. Has, does anybody have a question before I start reading? No, okay. So. So I'll recapitulate slightly. In 1965 to 66, uh, Gilbert Simondon held a course at the Institut de Psychologie at the Sorbonne, which was published posthumously in 2008 
as imagination and invention. Imagination et invention. And this has been, uh, as you know, recently translated into English by Joe Hughes and Christophe Wall Romana in 2022 that came out. Uh, so that's a, quite a significant lag, if you think, from the moment uh, where this lecture series was uh, given uh, to you know, its publication in English in the context, I think, of quite, um, quite an unprecedented interest in Simondon's work in the um, Anglophone creative and academia world. I've also, I also want to mention a absolutely brilliant doctoral thesis that I evaluated recently by Francesca Sunseri. Hopefully that's going to be published and hopefully in English too, uh, because she really showed in her thesis how um, important experimental psychology was for Simondon. Uh, I confirm her, what she says in her thesis, which is that most commonly this is um, been presented as if Simondon, after uh, doing his magnificent doctoral thesis in philosophy, he was uh, he then had to teach psychology and it was a kind of demotion because he couldn't teach philosophy. But actually, Francesca Sunseri shows that uh, Simondon uh, was uh, really his entire project was centered around and grappling with experimental psychology with the scientific status of experimental psychology and with integrating the scientific um, tenor of experimental psychology as opposed to something that used to belong only to philosophical speculation integrating this if you like in a renewed um, in a philosophy that would be invigorated by this scientific um, uh, import so I think that's something quite important to keep in the back of your mind and also to earmark uh, Francesca Sunseri as, you know, wait for her public the publication of her thesis. Um, it's, it's really very good. So to introduce Simondon, I'm going to foreground the relevance of his theory of mental images and in particular his concept of invention uh, for the question of intelligence and um, notably the notion whether or not we should uncritically adopt the notion of artificial intelligence. For this, I'm going to situate uh, the theory of mental images within the wider arc of his theory of individuation. Now, I realize for those of you who haven't worked on Simondon before, you you know, individuation sounds like maybe um, Jung's individuation, psychological individuation. We'll, we'll, we will get to this also in the question and answers. For now, um, I'm going to use the word individuation only from one of the angles that Simondon uh, discusses, which is ontogenesis, so the genesis of beings. Uh, and I'm going to explain in a minute how he's repurposing this to mean something else than the, bio the 19th century biologist who talked about the difference between ontogeny and phylogeny, whereby ontogeny would be the genesis and maturation of an individual organism. And the hypothesis of Haeckel was that in, in the genesis and maturation of the organism, you could see something like a recapitulation uh, of the stages of development in phylogenesis, that is, of the evolution of the species. So leaving that aside, Simondon uses the word ontogenesis slightly differently, quite differently, actually because he's not interested only in how um, entities come about. You could say individuation in the sense how individuals come about. But he wants to know how a system has to transform itself so that within, its, within it can arise something that you can discern as an entity. So the genesis here is, the, is in, a, in the widest speculative sense possible, the genesis of being itself. So being is not a kind of Parmenidian sphere that sits there eternally, but it is something that is not accidentally, but inherently in a process of becoming and self-transformation. And part of this self-transformation is within a pre-individual state, the emergence of something like a discernible entity or individual, hence individuation. So I will situate this idea of um, the genesis of mental images and their evolution in the wider arc of Simondon's theory of individuation. And we'll focus on invention 
as a stage in the development of mental images. And the stage I'm most interested in, and this is because I have previously been thinking about the relation between information and noise, is that Simondon highlights what comes before invention as something that is like um, de-differentiation of structures that had been already uh, constituted, of a kind of crisis of dissolution of things that made sense, structures that operated well. Um, and in this crisis of dissolution, you have like uh, an increase of potentiality and then all of a sudden an organization that has a kind of higher level of affordance of adaptability. So we'll, we'll get to this later, but it's the, the kind of connection between crisis and invention that I want you to keep in the back of your mind. So Simon Dans Simondon also makes, in this context, an interesting analogy between invention as a stage in the development of mental images and um, metamorphosis in biological organisms. Um, and this kind of analogy, I think, is quite interesting because it illuminates a certain naturalism, uh, whereby also, if you don't know Simondon that well, the concept of nature needs to be bracketed for a moment. He's, it's not necessarily... Um, as normally naturalism refers to what is empirically given, if you like, the inventory of what we call nature, whereas for Simondon, nature would be, uh, if you like, the, the fundamentally the, the potential to become that is inherent to being, including in its pre-individual um, state. So slightly, slightly different kind of naturalism going on here. But a naturalism nevertheless. So... Uh, one that allows an analogy between metamorphosis and invention. Okay, this analogy between invention and metamorphosis enables us, I believe, to ask crit critical questions concerning um, technologies like machine learning uh, and uh, especially large language models that fuel techno you know, apps like ChatGPT and so forth. Uh, these, in turn, use so-called transformer architectures that process vast data sets through so-called deep neural networks and do so to astonishing effect. They generate patterns from prompts so swiftly and produce texts so startlingly human-like that our conventional conceptions of intelligence seem to fail us when we try to distinguish the, these productions from uh, human-produced texts, for instance. For the purpose of, of the introduction today, I'm still going to refrain from using the term artificial intelligence without you know, either scare quotes or making, uh, making it evident that I don't accept, I resist taking over this um, expression or this denomination. And this is because as will also um, appear from reading Imagination and Invention, what we imagine intelligence to be has a performative and propensive force, one that impacts on how we collectively solve the problems that we face. So Simondon's account of metamorphosis and invention, I think, helps us to pinpoint a critical difference between intelligence in living beings on the one hand, and intelligence or, or uh, if you like, the efficiency of uh, what I will call automated processes of optimization. So this um, expression, automated processes of optimization, is a term that was suggested as more adequate than artificial intelligence by uh, Jagmar Denizan. Um, those of you who know me know that I love to refer to her paper, which I think is really a landmark paper uh, called Intelligence as the Border Activity Between the Modeled and the Unmodeled. Um, Denizan is a professor of engineering specializing in chaos control, so she really has uh, quite a good grasp also of um, um, of the technology that's involved, and um, she's also a philosopher and a longtime proponent of Simondonian perspectives in the field of biosemiotics. So Denizan's notion of intelligence as a border activity between the modeled and the unmodeled, 
So between um, what can be encompassed by the model of reality that we devise and what is left out knowingly or unknowingly. So what happens, uh, the difference between what we include in our model of reality and what is not included if you like, there is a, a kind of critical boundary here and the capacity to negotiate this boundary is what um, determines intelligence for Denizan. And she argues that that's something that uh, a machine can't do. And I'll get into this uh, in a little moment. So her notion of intelligence as a border activity between the modeled and the unmodeled can complement our understanding of Simon Don's concept of invention uh, especially if we read it in the wider arc of his theory of individuation. And something that I care a lot about and that I'm, that I'm going to um, focus, I'm going to kind of construct my argument around is, it's going to sound a little bit abstract now, but hopefully it'll be more concrete in a moment, is the tension between the bounded and the unbounded. So for Simon Don, the concept of nature, uh, I, I kind of pointed to that a moment ago, uh, is not the inventory of things we find in the flora and fauna around us, or even the geology, uh, but nature rather designates in a kind of pre-Socratic Ionian fashion what is pre-individual uh, and what Anaximander called the unbounded, the aperon. Aperon is literally that with, without boundary, which is also the indeterminate, what is unbounded and indeterminate. So why does that matter? Because um, we're going to see with Simon Don's theory of individuation that um, if you like, the becoming of being is a form of phase shift within this unboundedness and the emergence of a boundary. Uh, if The reason why I think this matters when thinking about technologies that use uh, statistical processing is that statistical processing fundamentally relies on the boundary, on the limited or finite nature of the data sets that are being processed. And this is, I hope, going to become a little more evident here. This idea of the boundary between the modeled and the modeled, uh, I think, is also an issue of the boundary of the data sets that go into the technologies um, that we use and that are being sorted. And uh, the relationship between the bounded and the unbounded in uh, the kind of wider theory of ontogenesis and individuation. So we'll see how these three levels, I think, connect to form a problem together. So let me first give a brief overview of Simon Don's own conception of the mental image. I'll then situate the idea of metamorphosis or the analogy with metamorphosis and the crisis of de-differentiation in the development of mental images uh, that is solved by the act of invention. And one in, in doing that, we'll also look at uh, the notion of information and the role that it plays more widely in Simon Don's theory of individuation, uh, here understood as a kind of large angle on ontogenesis, on the transformation of a system. What role does information play in the transformation of a system? And what role does it play in, as a result, in the development of mental images and invention? So for the purpose of uh, this introduction, but just for today, I'm going to use individuation as synonymous with ontogenesis, understood in this wider sense, and will neglect other but equally important aspects of individuation, uh, which are to do on the one hand with continuous variation of form. So for Simon Don, every individuation does not result necessarily in, uh, in, a, in an entity, a finished individualized entity, uh, but even the process of continuous variation of form uh, is a process of individuation. And then there is another aspect that isn't so explicit in Simon Don, but that is nevertheless necessary to keep in the back of our minds. Uh, Simon Don, when using the term individuation, and especially when critiquing what he calls the principle of individuation, is reviving a problem from medieval philosophy. That has a very important uh, position because it is it, this um, question of individuation reaches its climax, if you like, just at the cusp 
of a new era in uh, philosophy, which is the, the kind of um, phase shift, you could almost say, the transformation from a, a progressively more moderate realism. So we're starting with a realism, with not realism, how it's often portrayed today, that what exists in the world exists independently of our thought. You could say that that's a form of realism. Um, we're talking here about a kind of platonic realism, the realism of ideas, uh, whether universals are real or just in our mind. Um, and so this moment of the discussion of the problem of, of individuation was a, um, a critical turning point. Just after the problem of individuation was reached its apotheosis, if you like, in the work of uh, John Dun Scotus, um, you have a turn towards nominalism, the idea that universals and something I'll elucidate in a minute, common natures are just ideas. They're like um, post-its that we stick onto things uh, so that we can categorize them. But the only things that really exist that are really real are individuals. So once you have this turn towards nominalism, um, the problem of how not only how the individual emerges from what it emerges uh, recedes into the background, okay? because in this process of emergence, there are degrees of individuality. So that's no longer a question that needs asking. Um, and secondly, the question of the singularity of the individual. So if every apple tree produces apples, the apple as a category is not an individual, but the apple that I eat is individual because I ate only this one and not another one that looks the same. So what it was quite a mind um, boggling moment, this attempt to really understand what it is that makes something singular and non-equivalent with anything else. And this is something we discussed in the, uh, Simon Dorn information seminar and, and that matters to me also quite a lot but this is just to say we'll, here we'll, we'll talk just about the aspect of ontogenesis and we'll leave those other two aside but I want you to keep them in the back of your minds so I'll also briefly nod towards those of you who maybe have come across Spinoza's idea of natura naturans and natura naturata so the two conceptions of nature producing itself or naturing itself and nature as produced by itself. And Simon Dorn makes um, an analogous difference, if you like, between uh, the individuated individual, um, which, which would be the kind of individualized individual almost. It's, it's, it's the product, the entity that, it, that results from a process of individuation. And on the other hand, the individuating individual. So that's what I tried to hint at earlier, that individuation can uh, be the process that results in an entity, and individuation can also describe the continuous variation of form for Simon Dorn. And the continuous variation of form, if you like, would be this individuating individual, the process itself. So individuation, this refers on the one hand to what Simon Dorn calls a veritable ontogenesis of being that is the emergence within a system uh, of uh, the, the genesis and co-evolution of an individual and its milieu. So here you have a pre-individual being within it occurs something like a phase shift, a boundary emerges, a, bound, a topological boundary that, that you know, starts where we start to discern uh, an, a, an entity, an individual with an inside and an outside and also a chronology of a before and after. Um, so the individuated individual is then not the whole of ontogenesis, but only a partial result of the ontogenesis of being of the system. Uh, so the, individua the individuated individual is only a partial result of the veritable ontogenesis. The other aspect of individuation then is this topology of continuous variation of form, which you could des describe as um, the process of ontogenesis captured in mid-flight, so to speak, of an individuating individual, of the process of individuation, which may but does not have to close uh, and come to a term in the individuated individual. 
So I hope I'm. This is not too much of a mouthful. <laughs> this. Don't want to make it too much like verbiage, but it, I think it does matter. So now I'm going to share my screen and share uh, so that we can read together this slightly lengthy quote from Imagination and Invention, where Simondon lays out the analogy between metamorphosis and invention. In this instance, though, Simondon uses the term ontogenesis not in the way that I just described, which I need you to know, uh, to have in the back of your minds, but rather in the conventional sense of the genesis and maturation of an individual organism that goes through metamorphosis, just so that you know. Uh, and he compares the genesis and maturation uh, of the organism that goes through um, metamorphosis uh, with that of a system of mental images. So I'm going to share my screen. Um, how do I do that with a small... Sorry. Here we go. Sorry, this is not good. Ah, God, it's being recorded now. You all know what my to-do list is. It's really bad. Never mind. Here we go. Um, actually, let me unshare for a second. <laughs> Close any embarrassing messaging things here we go and now i share again okay see yeah that looks about right so we're starting here studies of ontogenesis this is simone Studies of ontogenesis, and he's talking here about in the traditional biological sense of, of um, the, the genesis and maturation of an organism. Studies of ontogenesis have shown that growth processes do not cover the organs and functional systems of a living being in a uniform way. There are lags in each partial growth, so there are several processes of, of um uh, ontogenesis going on within the organism, um, your you know vital functions, uh, organism, your organs, and so forth. They they don't mature all at the same time. But there, there's a kind of pluri, um, or polyrhythmic uh, development going on here between all the different processes of individuation that contribute to the organism coming about. So, growth processes do not cover organs. And functional systems, sorry about this. Um, I can't actually see, I'll have to switch this off. Oh, man. Sorry about that. I hope they're not going to call again. Anyway, stop. Uh, so, again, growth processes do not cover the organs and functional systems of a living being in a uniform way. So there's several things happening at the same time, not at the same speed. There are lags in each partial growth relative to the others. And there are different speeds, especially among complex organisms, so much so that it is difficult to establish the exact moment at which an organism reaches its complete adult stage. So this is my, uh, I've made this, um, I highlighted this in uh, this text here. Um, an organism reaches its complete adult stage. Moreover, growth and development display stages and cycles. So cycles that repeat themselves, separated by periods of transition 
in which there is a de-differentiation that is followed by reorganization. I'll give you examples for this in a moment. Such processes are very clear in the metamorphosis of some living species. Yet they also take place in the organic development and the ontogenesis of human behavior, including the development of mental images, you could add. Could we not then posit that mental images are like structural and functional subsets? So mental images are structural and functional subsets or are individuations within individuations. Structural and functional subsets of this organized activity that is psychic activity. The psychic activity is itself an individuation, a process of individuation. And within this, you have these other processes of uh, individuation that happen at uh, different speeds and according to their own cycles and that are subsets of psychic activity. These subsets, so the development of mental images, would thus possess a genetic dynamism analogous to that of an organ or of a system of organs on a trajectory of growth. So they have their own um, developmental uh, logic, if you like. And we could then essentially distinguish three stages. First, that of pure and spontaneous growth. This is prior to the experience of the object. He's talking about the development of mental images here. So mental images would arise, first of all, in a completely spontaneous way, uh, not as a representation of objects encountered, but prior to any experience of an object. So prior to the experience of uh, the object to which a functional activity is pre-adapted. So the organism is uh, pre-adapted in anticipation, if you like, uh, different species of animals are born with a pre-adapted anticipation of objects they, they will encounter. So pre-adapted by evolution, if you like. Um, so there is a first stage of mental images that is not representative of objects encountered, but that is, if you like, a form of pre-adaptation, is a form of anticipation of an experience yet to come. This would be in the image, the equivalent to the embryonic stages of organic growth. So we have, we start out with an embryonic stage of mental images, a spontaneous proneness and anticipation of experience. Each mental image as an M is an embryo of motor and perceptual activity. So it, it is a form of motivation almost. It develops itself for itself here as a non-controlled anticipation. So it's not systematized yet. And it does so through reference to the experience of the milieu. So at a later stage, experience will start to systematize these uh, spontaneous um, mental images and to a free state, which is to stay, which is to say without strict correlation to other subsets of psychic activity. So there's a kind of anarchic uh, proliferation of mental images uh, that you're born with almost as a as a kind of anticipation of future experience and experience then progressively, uh, rather than each of these mental images being independent from the other, they become correlated and systematized uh, as experience progresses. So if you have a question at this point, you can also interrupt me. So I realize that this quote is a little bit long. Uh, it's not that long, so it stops here, but still it's quite dense. So each image then would be like an embryo of motor and perceptual activity, the embryo of a motor tendency of, a, of movement and of future perception. So you don't have perception yet, but you already have mental images in an embryonic stage. And each develops itself for itself as a non-controlled anticipation that spontaneously erupts, non-controlled, uncorrelated with the other images. And through reference to the experience of the milieu, uh, so it, it arises at first without reference to the milieu and to experience in a free state without correlation to other subsets of psychic activities, so kind of anarchic. At this point, the mental image displays pre-adaptations, but not yet adaptations. 
the mental image then becomes a mode of receiving information coming from the milieu. So the image is not post-experience, it's not the representation of what we experience. It is a pre-adaptation, an evolutionary and species-specific pre-adaptation without which we would struggle to receive information from the environment. It becomes a prism through which we respond to information from the environment. Notably, fight or flight, um, uh, um, predation, and so forth. So, sorry, I lost the line. Um, it, display, it displays pre-adaptations, but not yet adaptations. The image then becomes a mode of receiving information coming from the milieu and a source of response schemas, so pre-adapted response schemas to these stimuli. In perceptual motor experience, so perception and movement are coupled together in perceptual motor experience, images then become effectively and directly functional. So they, they render perception and movement functional. They organize and stabilize themselves in internally correlated groups. So the mental images become um, coherent and systematic as experience progresses according to the dimensions of the relationship between the organism and the milieu. Later, finally, after this stage of interaction with the milieu, which corresponds to a learning process, an apprentissage, afterwards you have another layer, which is the affective emotional repercussion. There's another layer of affect and emotion, which completes the organization of images according to a systematic mode of linkages. So the, the image, uh, the, the affect and emotion, if you like, seal the, the way that images will be linked in a systematic way. A systematic mode of linkages evocations and communications. So one thing leads to another in the chain of mental images. And this, um, this systematic linkage is, if you like, sealed by this additional layer of a kind of affective emotional repercussion of experience and mental images. Through this process, a veritable, we're here, a veritable mental world is constituted a mental world of, of mental images in which there are regions, domains, and qualitative key points through which the subject commands an analog of the internal milieu, of the external milieu, sorry, through which the subject commands an analog of the external milieu, an analog that has its own constraints, its own topology, and its own complex modalities of access. So this is something, because I, I skipped in this introduction, the beginning of um, the introduction to imagination and invention, which I hope some of you have had time to read, where Simondon uh, describes the relative independence from consciousness of this world of mental images. The fact that um, we don't control necessarily the mental images that come into to our mind, that we are sometimes controlled by mental images and their emotive and affective repercussions within us. Um, and also that the, there is a um, world of images, if you like, constituted not only within the mind, but also culturally around us. Anyway, a point that Simondon makes that is quite important is that um, he distinguishes himself from previous history of philosophy or previous philosophers who thought of um, perception, uh, recollection, and imagination as faculties. And Simondon says, no, they're not separate faculties. You can't understand them unless you understand them as moments where this process of individuation or ontogenesis of the world of mental images uh, periodically um, pierces through into the level of consciousness. So we become conscious of this process uh, when we perceive, we become conscious of this process when we recollect images and we become conscious of this process when we invent. 
but it's a process that happens the same way that um, our ontogenesis happens to us and most of it is not conscious. Um, so this just to say that there is a very, through this progressive, you start with these spontaneous, uh, almost anarchic, pre-adapted mental images uh, that predispose the organism to react, the, the organism according to species, to react in a specific way to their environment when they're born. This is why most species, humans are a bit different in that, um, are already well adapted to their environment when they're born, are better adapted than, than humans for the most part. Uh, and these mental images very quickly become systematically linked as uh, in feedback with the experience of the environment. And once a kind of affective emotional layer comes on top of this, reverberates through this experience, the sequence of mental images is kind of consolidated and uh, sealed in a way. Not, not terminally sealed, but it becomes, this is what makes uh, the likelihood of progression of mental images to happen uh, in, a in a repeatable way. So in this process, a veritable mental world is constituted. It's not a representation of the outside world. It's not just a mirror world. Uh, it is a world that has its own regions, domains, and qualitative key points, which are not necessarily conscious, and through which the subject um, has at its disposition, consciously or not, an analog of the external milieu. You could say here, to, to anticipate what we're going to get to later, a form of, that it's a model, it's a complex model of the world of experience that is constituted by the mental images within us. One, this model has its own constraints, its own topology, that is the ideas hang together in, in a way that is um, specific to the way that the mental images arose and interacted with experience. Um, and it has its own complex modalities of access. So how a mental image pops into your mind, uh, how it um, obsesses you, uh, what you forget, what you remember, and so forth, uh, belongs to the complex modalities of access to this mental world. So last paragraph, and then we come back to the language of ordinary mortals. In other words, images undergo successive mutations. So not just the image, I would say, but he probably means the, the interconnection between these spontaneous images. Undergo successive mutations that modify their mutual relations by making them pass from the status first of a primitive mutual independence or an anarchic spontaneous um, uh, bubbling up of mental images then to a phase of interdependence at the moment the object is encountered. So experience consolidates the relationship between these pre-adapted images. On to finally a state of systematic and necessitating linkage. This is where emotion and affect come in. That the way mental images are linked together uh, in uh, predation, for example, or in um, mating are um, systemat become systematic in which primitively kinetic energies, so random movement, is translated into tensions within the system. So if you think of a, of a newborn baby that randomly agitates its arms and limbs, this kinetic energy also exists in, in other um, organisms. And the part, as, one aspect of the formation of mental images is that this kinetic energy is transformed into a tension attention as a potential for movement. Um, so after the systematic and necessitating linkage of mental images, which could be through affect and emotion, but you could also extrapolate later in philosophy, for instance, or in science, it can be a linkage through uh, logic and reason. Um, oh, I should keep losing my line here. Ah, yeah. uh, systematic and uh, the final state is one of systematic and necessitating linkage in which the primitively kinetic energies have become tensions within a system. So the, men, the, the genesis of the world of mental images uh, captures the kinetic energy of the organism and 
stores it as tension within this world of mental images. So images are not just representations. They're not just ever um, simply images, so to speak, but they are um, keys, keys or nodes in a system of tensions and potentials. They are always, um, if you like, movement withheld. Movement withheld or movement suspended. Desires, fears, and so forth. Invention could then be considered as a shift in the organization of the system of adult images. So you have already your analogon uh, to the world of experience, your model of reality, a complex topology of linked mental images. And um, invention then is this stage of maturity where you have a, where you are you become capable of bringing about a fundamental and deep shift in the way that these images are interlinked and organized. Once this occurs, you return mental activity to a new state of free images. So once you invent this organization, reorganization of mental images, the reconnection of, of the, the, the shuffling of the car of the deck of cards, if you like, um, is for a moment a return to the initial stage where the mental images were free and anarchic. You could say this corresponds to the moment of de-differentiation of the structure that had held the images in a certain sequence previously. So invention could then be considered as a shift in the organization of the system of adult images, returning the mental activity to a new state of free images, but with a change of level. So you're not at the same level as the first spontaneous uh, mental images of, of the embryo, or the kind of embryonic stage, but rather at a stage that allows the genesis to start again. Invention would be the rebirth of the cycle of images, but one that permits a new cycle, that permits an approach to the milieu that has new anticipations and adaptations that were not possible for the primitive, or the primitive in the sense of the first spontaneous adaptations, the ones that you inherit from evolution, uh, here, the cycle starts again, but at a higher level with the possibility of adaptations that were not given by evolution, but that you give yourself through this act of invention. Um, and also new anticipations. At this level, you can anticipate through the act of invention, you anticipate the coming about of a reality that you could have not anticipated simply on the basis of your evolutionary predispositions when you're born. So invention is the rebirth of the cycle of images, but at a level that permits an approach to the milieu that has new anticipations from which new adaptations can emerge that were not possible in the primitive or kind of embryonic or early stages. And then a new internal and symbolic systematization comes about. So the, Im the way that the images will be, uh, the mental images are organized among themselves, concatenated through the act of invention, are not the same. You have a new model of reality, let's say, for example, in uh, relativity theory, uh, it's not the same uh, as the one that you were, uh, that spontaneously arose and concretized through your experience with the environment. So in other words, and then we stop this long um, quote, in other words, invention operates a change of level. It marks the end of a cycle and the beginning of another. Each cycle comprises these three phases, anticipation, experience, and systematization. And to this we may add, which he doesn't mention here, the de-differentiation, the return to free play that happens before anticipation, or where new anticipations become possible. So a bit long, a bit dense. I hope that me kind of explaining it while we're reading, I didn't make it more confusing than it probably is already when when jumping in firsthand. Before we continue, is there any question? Does anyone want a clarification? Have I gobsmacked everyone? <laughs> I hope not. You please feel free to 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 chip in, even if you think, "What well, what is this word?" or "How does this hang together?" or "Was this all clear?" I have a question, if you don't mind. Please go ahead. So what we're talking about now is 
essentially, if I understood correctly, Simon Don's rendition of the ontogenesis of uh, human consciousness? No, not quite, because consciousness itself is only a fraction. If, if I would say this way, and this is my interpretation, the same way that the individual or the entity that arises in a process of veritable ontogenesis, I just say veritable to distinguish it here, um, consciousness would be a, the discernible, a discernible thought, discernible by consciousness, but it's part of this wider ontogenesis, which is your um, genesis and maturation as a living being that is a system within which other processes of individuation happen, notably your psychic activity, only parts of which are conscious. Mm -hmm. You could say that the conscious parts are the, the these um, points of access yeah topology of the mental world so all that is mental is not necessarily conscious no absolutely. i see what you mean i see that that you're saying that um that consciousness would be what um is kind of the peaks of this activity is that what I'm, you I'm, I'm just also reading it uh in relation to husserl and his genetic uh phenomenology also because at some point in the text uh, Simon Dong himself says that this sort of analysis is phenomenological, although he probably means something else. I lost you. Wait, where are you? Um, are they? No, sorry. Ah, there you are. Can you say that again with um, Husserl? Yeah, yeah. So essentially, I'm, 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 I'm only thinking about consciousness in the sense of, uh, of the ego, sort of in the way that Husserl would uh, understand it only because at some point in the text, Simon Don says that this sort of analysis that he undertakes is uh, phenomenological. Um, and so I'm reading it in relation to Husserl's uh, genetic phenomenology, basically, which is maybe a mistake and I shouldn't be doing that. No, I'm sure it's not a mistake. I just think probably it requires very close reading so that you can... Um... It might be a good idea for a presentation, for example. Um, I'm not a, a Husserl reader. I, um, my knowledge of Husserl is very, very superficial. Um, the only thing I would say is that uh, the ego certainly would be something like I, I would. This is I say certainly, and to me, I I think the ego belongs to this uh, analogon, the the mental, the the kind of system of mental images that constitutes something like an ego is probably um, involved in these kind of um, concurrent processes of individuation, each at their own pace, sometimes with tension between them. And there is also the development of a um, mental world, if you like, or the mental analogon of, uh, if you like, a, a model of the self, probably. Mm. I, I, would imagine, I would imagine it a little bit like this. Because when you say that uh, that uh, he wants to distinguish, uh, sorry, last question. He said you say that uh, he wants to distinguish himself from uh, other philosophers of of mind or of consciousness that uh, distinguish between different uh, mental faculties. In what way does he, in his idea of the ontogenesis of the mental world, um, uh, justifies the distinct ness of uh memory for instance as opposed to um other mental processes well this is it it's that uh it's not distinct as a separate faculty from perception mm -hmm. is that you have in his account uh every species i think one of the examples that pops up in my mind is the um uh the skücken what's the english word um the chick that is born and that immediately knows how to pick corn. And um, sorry, what did I want to say? Ah, yeah, that before the encounter of the, or before perception, there are these evolutionary pre adaptations. Mm -hmm. um, so rather than having faculties where you think, I perceive, I remember what I perceived, and on the mm -hmm. basis of what I perceived, I invent, what you have is um, a process 
analogous to, or it's one of the processes of ontogenesis that together with others, the genesis of your organs, uh, of behavioral functions, um, of, um, I don't know, vital functions, all these occur concurrently, each at their own speed, and the mental images also arise from this evolutionary pre-adaptation to the encounter with the with the object or the encounter with the environment where they get systematized uh, on and so forth. So the moments of consciousness of these, like when, when you are conscious of perceiving something, are like an epiphenomenon rather than uh, a, a faculty in its own right. Mm -hmm. The moments when this process, which happens also when you're not conscious, when you sleep, uh, so, or maybe even in the womb, I don't know, for humans, um, mm. is when when these kind of pierce through uh, to the level from the from the pre-conscious to the conscious. I don't know if that's a good answer to your question. I think the yes. better answer to the question would certainly come from uh, if you wanted to do a small presentation on um, if, on this the comparison, perhaps, of what you what you take uh, Husserl's account. Of the different cognitive faculties to be in the tension with Simon Dong. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Uh, Vitor, you wanted to say something? Yes, um, I, uh, I don't know if I lost something, but I get a little uh, confused about uh, when you mentioned that mental images capture the chaos of Leo in form of tension. I don't understand exactly how they do that and why they do that at that point. So can you, the line is not so good on my end. The mental. Oh, sorry, sorry. Again, it's better now. Little, yeah. Go, okay. uh, I don't understand exactly when you said that mental images capture the chaos of milieu in form of tension. I'm not saying how. how I'm sorry. I I the, can you write it perhaps in the chat for yes, me? Yes, yes, I can write. One second. And then I need to just, I will stop sharing now as well, because then I can go back to to the chat and everything. Um, so perhaps while you write that, oh yeah, yeah, I see the chat now, Yagmur Denizan, exactly, Yuval, thank you. Um, I'll post the, the link in here for the text as well. Um, while you write that, Vitor, shall I uh, take, I can't remember if Cassandra or Joao, uh, Joao raised their hand first. If you, you know who did, then please go ahead. I'll defer, I'll defer, please. Joao, go right ahead. Okay, thank you, Cassandra. Joao, do you want to go? Okay, um, I have a question. Um, it just occurred to me while you, you were uh, saying that um, in the in the first section of the text, uh, Simon Don introduces a difference between signal and symbol, and I, I just wonder that um, if um, when when the the internal organization of the symbolic structure saturates, and then an invention occurs, sometimes a symbol becomes a signal. Can you say that again? When there is an invention in the because there is a saturation in the internal organization uh, symbolic organization, is there a possibility of a symbol to become a signal? Uh, yes, because they, they are not ontologically different, if you like, but different in their function. So in a presentation recently, uh, Shashin Wei, who's also intervened in the in these seminars before. It gave a very beautiful, a strong example of the difference between uh, signal and symbol. Uh, he wasn't talking specifically about Simon Don, but I think it, it's a, a really strong image. He asked his students to bring a symbol. Uh, and one student brought a feeding bowl that was the bowl from which they were fed their first uh, solid food after weaning. And that bowl had been used... Uh, by the grandmother to feed the mother and the grand great grandmother to feed the grandmother and so forth. So the bowl itself was um, symbolic because it was the counterpart to her experience 
that it, that is significant the counter it was also symbolic of the relationship with loved ones the symbolic of the relationship with food um in for simondon he foregrounds the idea of the symbol the etymological idea of um of an object that is, together right yeah, that is broken in halves and two people each can serve a half and when you can put them together and the the point of fissure fits perfectly um if you like the symbol is the point of the symbol would be that you could reunite it it stands in for the completeness that is lost of something it it calls back the other aspect of the experience whereas the sign would be the image of the feeding bowl or the word feeding bowl it is something that is um a signifier without having the function of uh, the evocative function, if you like, uh, or, or the key and the um, and the lock are symbolic in the sense that uh, a key is only a key if it opens a lock. It's not the object on itself on its own that is a key. So the symbol is always a symbol because it connects with the reality. Whereas the signifier is, um, you can change signifier. You can um, you can devise a convention according to you know in cryptology for example what you can use whatever sign you want uh, to designate a certain reality and it's only a designation rather than the evocation of a complete reality of which you only have a fragment that stands in if you like for the for the reality did that did that answer the question no because yeah, you were asking whether symbols can become signs and signs can become symbols i was just thinking um that sometimes when I experience but but the evocational aspect in question of a, a certain image, then we would just become a sign. It would not evoke a certain that, that aspect of the evocation. I think he talks about the nostalgic hexing aspect of the, the symbol, right? Yes, yes, exactly. How, yeah, how it becomes, um, I think it just, I mean, I don't want to, you know, it's always difficult to give uh, interpretations on the fly, but to, to me, it's when the symbol loses this evocative uh, force that also always is, if you like, this um, kinetic energy in suspense. So with the symbol, it's clear because the symbol is a kind of longing for reuniting this fragment with with a whole in terms of uh, it can be fear it can be desire um whereas with the sign i think it's is a question of uh, probably of, of conventions of um coherence amongst signs yeah i need to think about this more but it's a very good question i do think you can it's a question of functionalities how how it operates rather than what it is you're welcome. Um, Cassandra, and nice to meet you, by the way, all of you. Nice to meet you. Hi, Hi. can you hear me okay? Yep. Wonderful. Um, I just wanted to return to this brief uh, question we touched on above, uh, uh, that Simone Doan was, was interested in reviving uh, certain questions from medieval philosophy. Uh, and and so th there's an account of a veritable ontogenesis of being, and, and, and thus a movement from a sort of free individual uh, condition to it to uh, so an account of not just the individual that it's emerged that emerges but the process of individuation that is sort of like excessive over and above that um, and I, and I, and there's sort, sort of um, so it, the, it's sort of a facile question I guess like like could this process of individuation is this self same with the question of, of the mellow or is it is the mellow sort of a, 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 a I'm trying to get a grip on the willow, basically. Willow yeah. language. No, this is a this is a very important question. And also I realized that I probably introduced a small um ambiguity. The medieval problem, and I think it wasn't for Simondon, he frames it in terms of Aristotle, the question of individuation. But uh in terms of the history of philosophy, uh it became a formal problem for the medieval scholars who were interpreting interpreting Aristotle. So they were thinking about the ontological status of the individual as singular. What is different? Uh, how is the individual different from any other entity, even if, if it's like another entity? What is it that makes this individuality? It's a really right. fascinating question if you can get into it. That's not how Simonton approaches the problem. He looks at individuation in terms of a question of 
Genesis uh, and blows the question wide open and goes all the way back to the pre-Socratics uh, to look at this kind of pre-individual apeiron uh, with Anaximander and how individuals can emerge from this. Now, the question of the milieu is the pre-individual is not a system and it's not a milieu. It is rich in potentiality, so it's not just a kind of white sheet. Uh, it has um, uh, it, it has kind of nodes of singularities. It has uh, thresholds. It, it's it's a kind of um, space full of potentialities mm. that are based on the disparity. For example, my example, but it's not an example that Simondon gives, as far as I remember, is the um, a charged atmosphere when you have a storm, you have positive and negative charge. So you have a disparity here. Um, you don't have a system yet. It's when the um, lightning resolves this tension between positive and negative charge and discharges this tension. It connects the positive and negative charge through its own individuation as a lightning. But the whole system of charge, of, of tension, uh, that's the pre-individual individuates individuates through the lightning so the lightning is one aspect of the individuation of the whole system but it only becomes a system because of the lightning so right. before that right. you have a disparity between positive and negative charge and when this disparity suddenly starts to communicate through its discharge in the lightning that's when temporarily you have a system if you like so the milieu would be the resonance that is established between the positive and negative charge through the process of individuation that's when you have a milieu at the same time as the process of individuation yes and both Perfect. evolve together so you can't have and the the uh, genesis and transformation of uh, the individual without the genesis and transformation of its milieu and Wonderful. when they are Thank adapted to much. each other then they are an associated milieu if you like but anyway yeah so, Excuse me, but please continue. But yes, that that very helpful, incredibly. Thank you. Okay, thank you for the question. It was a really important question. Uh, I think it was it Jeff and then Reda. Did I get that right? Or was yeah. it Reda first? I think I had. Okay, uh, go ahead, please. And I think this this question sort of comes out of the last one, and I followed along in the individuation seminar and some of the reading for today brought up a similar question about how the process um, gets off the ground. You may have just answered this with the, the metaphor of the lightning, but um, I wonder if it's, um, to me, I'm not sure it's adequately explained, like how the initial differentiation um, that um, in, initial differentiation of the first stage of individuation kind of gets off the ground. Like, what is it? And um, just... Um, you know, you mentioned one quote, pure and spontaneous growth, I think he says at one point, which doesn't explain much. Um, no. But the de-differentiation does. So I'm I'm interested in in sort of how we can account for the emergence out of de-differentiation of new distinctions. Um, yeah. And do we need, and this gets to my interest, in, uh, um, notions of randomness or chance or contingency, that begin to tell us something or at least provide an explanation that we can work with um, that can sort of uh, answer that question. Okay, if I, I if I may, uh, this is literally the next part of my presentation. Okay. So uh, no, it's, it is therefore also, I think, a very important question, exactly the same question I asked myself uh, when, when trying to um, engage with this. So perhaps just so as not to to double up on it, but I maybe when I read sure. it, uh, when I read it out, we can come back to the question and see if it answered your question uh, in exactly the way that you had it in your mind, um, and then we can kind of go a little bit more into detail. Sure, that's perfect. Uh, I'm also worried that I won't contradict myself if I don't reread it first. <laughs> um, so we'll come back to that in a second, if I may, uh, Jeff. Uh, Reda. Yes, so uh, my question goes uh, in the same path of when we did talk about um, uh, Gilbert Simondon 
uh, reviving of this uh, medieval tradition. Uh, because when I was reading the, the, the text yesterday, uh, it struck me that he was talking about uh, the cycle, life as a cycle of, uh, of uh, a genesis of images. So it, it's, it's so similar to what uh, some uh, Arab scholars, for example, as a uh, uh, Ibn Tufayl, uh, Avicen, and 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 Sarawardi in 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 uh, Philosophus Autodidacticus did. So they did give. I could write the names in the. Uh, I heard Avicenna, but I didn't yeah. hear all the other names that you mentioned. Yeah. If you could. Uh, I mentioned them in the Arabic. Uh, uh, yeah, please do. Please put yeah. if you can. If you know also the Latin name, if you could put both the Arabic and the Latin name, and for some for yeah. So I will Google the, the, the and even Latin yeah. I know, but the others I might not know. So if you... I will Google the the, the Latin names and the uh, so it's 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 uh, uh, Ibn Tufayl. It's it's the, the, the most well known with his uh, Philosophus uh, Autodidactus uh, or Hay uh, Ibn Yaqadan. So he did give a genesis. Uh, uh, to 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 this question of 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 uh, individualization mainly based on 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 uh, uh, Farabi's reading of uh, or uh, Farabi's synthesis of uh, Plato and and uh, and uh, Aristotle. So uh, my question is uh, when 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 he talk about life as a cycle of 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 uh, the genesis of images. Uh, was he referring to the same ten like Atabula Raza when when uh, uh, invention uh, will come as uh, as he say in old age like uh, old age correspond to the possibility of invention and renewal so because it's it's literally the same thing what what uh, what uh, uh, Ibn Tufail says so Hayibni Yaqazan. Uh, in grow age, he 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 found wisdom, and he tried to share this wisdom with others, but others refused, and and the story goes on. So that's my yeah. I, this wish. is the story of the autodidact, no? The kind yeah, of, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. First uh, ever Robinson Crusoe, yeah, yeah. where where you have a child who's on a uh, alone on an island and becomes yeah. a sp yes. philosopher all by himself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it's, no, it's... we're going to do something a little bit differently from the uh, other seminars. I would like you to give a presentation on Ibn Tufail, if you don't mind. Yeah, if, yeah, sure. If you, if you yeah, can, you could, you could, um, uh, you know, bring in Simon Don as far as as you're comfortable with it. Um, so I say different because I think traditionally people uh, do presentations on the texts that are um, in the syllabus. I've only put imagination and invention because I want to stay close to the text. And as we discuss things, we can throw more texts in, but I didn't want you to go off and disperse. Uh, and I would like you to bring your own interests and materials in, uh, like Husserl, for example, uh, with the question previously, and, and here with Ibn Tufail. Uh, Simon Don, I don't think I have to go back to his history of the individual history of philosophy, the notion of the individual in the history of philosophy. I think apart from Ibn Rushd or Averroes, he didn't have a really great grip on the importance of uh, the Arabophone philosophers uh, for the Latin philosophers. But it still is very interesting that you ask this question because, uh, so for two questions, two things first, it's not life as the ontogenesis of or individuation of mental images. Mental images are a subset of individuation. So there are organisms that have no mental images, uh, that have uh, kinetic pre-adaptations perhaps, but no mental images. Um, I, I suppose you need a nervous system for that to a certain extent. Um, so you have the idea to retain is that within ontogenesis, you have like a matryoshka doll of different ontogenesis. Every individual is itself to a certain extent a pre-individual state within which there are more individuations so within us there are concurrently um you know the individuation of our organs uh, individuations of uh, behavioral schemas uh, the individuation of psychic functions and within that as a subset the individuation of mental images and each of these have a relative autonomy with respect to the rest but not a complete autonomy so degrees of autonomy if you like 
So that's just one thing, not to confuse the individuation of life or of human life with uh, that of, in, of uh, mental images. The other aspect then, just to come back to this medieval question, for the medievals, they were not interested necessarily in the genesis of beings. They wanted to know the status, the ontological status, how is the category of the individual different from the category of a species or from the category of the genera? What is it that makes something, why is something singular rather than, you know, common to a category of others? And within that, Avicenna or Ibn Sina was actually uh, one of the most important figures for uh, Dan Scotus because he had this notion of the common nature. Uh, common nature in, in for Ibn Sina is still relatively simple. If I'm not a medievalist, so I hope I'm not bungling this up too badly. Uh, the idea that Socrates, for example, is an individual. What is individual about Socrates is his Socrateity, but he's also human. And to be human is his common nature. Uh, now, the interesting thing about common natures for me is that the common nature is not the same as a universal. So on the basis of our experience of patterns or things that are similar, humans, for example, we develop the concept of what a human is. It has, uh, I don't know, bipedal, uh, rational, blah, blah, blah. Um, from the contemporary point of view, what is very interesting about this difference between common natures and uh, universals is that you could think it about it as a relationship between patterns and concepts. And um, our concepts throughout the history of science change. So I would imagine that from a contem contemporary point of view, this relationship between common nature, to not have them as one, you don't have, what I'm trying to get at is that you have a critique of universals uh, prevalent uh, as part of the critique of the dark side of the Enlightenment, if you like, of, of universals that were actually a means of oppression and denigration of others. So if you throw out the universals, you risk throwing out the baby with the bathwater. You risk throwing out the common natures, which are experiences that require that we find concepts for things that are not just totally different and diverse, but that have things in common. And these concepts can change and they can be debated. So and for me, this is this would be one way of rescuing the problem of uh, universals, for example. I don't know if, if we're going too far, but this idea of the common nature, yeah, Avicenna was, uh, if I understood correctly, was the most important, one of the most important sources for Dan Scotus and for that whole period. Uh, and in a different way, Ibn Hurst or Averroes, because he, he systematized the reading of, um, of Aristotle before it was then kind of recaptured by the Latins and um, all, yeah. It's a very, very fascinating his moment in the history of uh, philosophy. One that interestingly, medievalists know very well. It would be very difficult to find a medievalist who doesn't know the importance of the Arabophone interpretations for the not only the rediscovery, they weren't just texts that were preserved and translated, but really laying the ground for understanding Aristotle in the Christian world. Um, but later, subsequently, this was erased. So when people speak about Western philosophy, it's as if this had never happened, which is uh, supremely annoying, I think. Okay, so I don't know if I answered too long because this is a really interesting moment in the history of philosophy. Yes, thank you so much. Um, was there another question or shall we continue? Uh, what's the time, seven? Uh, okay, we still have... Uh, how long do we have? What time do we finish at 9.30, right? 9.30 my time. In an hour, yes? Okay. So let's see how far I can uh, get. We don't have to finish uh, everything here because I want to have, I want to finish in 10, 15 minutes time so that we have ample time to, to discuss uh, the presentations. If you have questions about the essays, um, and more, and most importantly, I would like to um, know who you all are, for those of you whom I haven't met yet, what you bring to this, what you hope to get out of it, and so forth. But for now, bear with me without visuals, without PowerPoint, uh, close your eyes, I'll try and I'll be neither too slow to make you fall asleep, nor too fast so that you don't understand. 
I'll do my best here. So, Simon Don, uh, in order to understand the scope of the imagination beyond the individual in which the mental image is actualized, we thus need to understand uh, adequately what he means by ontogenesis, and we've already come to that, so I'll go through this a little bit more quickly, ontogenesis as encompassing the becoming of the entire system, the genesis of a system from a pre-individual state, within which processes of form taking occur, entities arise, uh, rather than just the genesis of forms. So it's the becoming of being and the becoming of systems within which individuals arise, or individual entities, including mental images or worlds of mental images. The individuation of the subject, uh, of the individual, uh, now in the ordinary sense of uh, uh, thinking subject, for instance. Um, little parenthesis, even the notion of subject isn't necessarily the same as that of individual for Simon Tom, but we'll discuss this perhaps another time. Here we'll just say in, in the ordinary sense of the, the thinking, imagining subject like you and me, must be placed in the system within which occurs. And the secondary individuation, that of mental images, likewise, so that that which arises in us, we are the pre-individual within which the world of mental images can arise. Uh, likewise, is tributary to both the individual that becomes a space of affordance for the world of mental images and the wider system within which related and stratified processes of individuation occur. So other individuations uh, our co-individuation together with other individuals and so forth. Like that of, um, so the example here was the individual organism and the mental images. So that levels of stratifications like a matryoshka doll of different processes of, um, well, matryoshka doll is not a good image because they're not necessarily contained one by the other, but they happen concurrently, not necessarily at the same speed, but they do hang together, they inform each other. Simondon has in mind this much broader sense than the more familiar idea of ontogeny or ontogenesis, which was coined in the 19th century by Ernst Haeckel. With Simondon, ontogenesis refers to more than the development of the organism from fertilization to maturity across the entire uh, lifespan of an organism, uh, and uh, which Haeckel suggested would constitute a recapitulation of the species evolution. So from embryo to mature, the transformation from embryo to mature um, individual, Haeckel thought, uh, somehow retells the story of our phylogeny of as a species. So Simon Dons takes this differently, rather than this, he says, restricted and derived sense of the individual's genesis, Simon Dor conceives of a veritable ontogenesis that encompasses the becoming of the entire system within which there is a process of form taking um, and the entity arises. So as the, the individual is the, if you like, the together with its environment, they are both the results of this systemic ontogenesis. We saw that the mental image becomes a system for the reception of signals and for the reception of information coming from the milieu. So the pre-adaptation of the chick that is born and that knows how to identify corn and, and pick it uh, is a kind of um, uh, what, where was I? Um, is, is, is this pre-adaptation is a system for reception. If you didn't have this pre-adaptation or this kind of spontaneous mental images, it wouldn't know the difference between a stone and a grain of, of corn. Perhaps it doesn't, I don't know. Uh, but certainly it survives because there is the poss possibility to receive the vital information from its environment, which is pre-given. So it intervenes... Um, no, wait, uh, becomes a system of reception of signals and information coming from the milieu and a source for schemata for processing information. So it's because you have pre-adaptations that you can form schemas for um, integrating the information that you get and for correlating. The experience is what correlates these initially independent mental images 
into schemas. So let's first get a basic understanding of what Simondon means by information and how it fits in this veritable ontogenesis of which the individual is only a byproduct. So another, you know, is not at all what you think information is. It's, it's quite, I love Simondon. It's, it's a real roller coaster. You don't get a break, basically, I think, compared to many other philosophers. No, actually, philosophy never gives you a break, but anyway. Information is what catalyzes a process of transformation in a metastable system. What is information? It's what catalyzes the transformation of the system and brings about the process of individuation. What could that be? Uh, information is what intervenes in a system, for example, in the manner of a threshold of intensity that is crossed. For instance, when the tension in the atmosphere reaches a threshold, uh, and the tension is discharged in the transitory individuation of the lightning bolt, or of a singularity or event that brings about a tipping point. So information is what brings about the tipping point in a situation that is tense and full of potential. It's what provokes a bifurcation or phase shift of the system, um, as when a grain of dust perhaps triggers the process of crystallization in the oversaturated mother liquor. So information is not some something, not even a sign. Information does not exist without a system that is ready to uh, erupt, if you like, or re ready to transform itself, but that lacks something that brings about this transformation. So information doesn't exist without this system of tension. That what, it's what provokes a bifurcation or phase shift in the system. Um, so what characterizes then an event as information or an entity as information has to be its affinity with the potentialities of a system. So something that is information in one context is not information in another. The grain of dust in the saturated uh, solution is information, but it is not in the desert of Gobi. Um, a lightning, a lit match, for instance, is information if you throw it in an oil well. It's not information if you throw it in a puddle of water. So what characterizes an event or an entity as information is this affinity with the potentialities to trigger the potentialities, to actualize the potentialities of a system. It is the suitability here and now, always specific to a context, uh, that enables information to couple what were previously disparate dimensions of a system, so the positive and negative charge, for instance, and to actualize its potentials. And not just that, but to modulate the available energy. So the energy that is set free, that was potential, that is actualized, isn't, uh, it doesn't express itself completely randomly, but is modulated by the information. It is the information, if you like, gives it form when we're talking about um, information as what triggers individuation. So it's a suitability in the here and now is what uh, enables information to couple disparate dimensions of a system, is what actualizes the potentials of the system, and it's what modulates and structures the available energy that it has if you like, um, rendered accessible. Information is thus the incident of something that is suitable, hic et nunc, for catalyzing the process of ontogenesis. And we're here using ontogenesis as um, synonymous with individuation without forgetting that there's these other things going on with individuation too. Indiv information, in other words, it is what triggers the process of individuation, it's what calls for individuation. It is what makes sense according. Ah, this is a quote, actually. Sorry, I ah, know where does the quote start? Information is what triggers the process of individuation. It calls for individuation. Uh, and it is what makes sense according to the process of individuation. And here I quote Simon Dorn now information is an initiation of individuation. It is a requirement for individuation, and it is the direction according to which the system individuates, end of quote. 
This is from uh, his main thesis, Individuation in Light of the Notions of Form and Potential. Information in this sense is never a given. And to anticipate the critique of the term artificial intelligence that uh, we'll conclude with, information cannot then be conflated with data that is fed into uh, and trained for machine learning processes like large language models that I use, for instance, in ChatGPT. Data is not information. It's not because something is given that it is information. It's only information if it can trigger a system to individuate itself, if it can actualize the potentials of a situation. Information then is always a tension of form that corresponds to the metastability of a system. Metastability is, is when, uh, for instance, I put a um, tennis ball on my desk um, and something, I, someone opens the window, a little brush of air makes the tennis ball roll to the side and it has the potential to transform its potential into kinetic energy and to fall to the ground. So metastable system is one that is stable, but uh, fragile and no, well, stable, but has the possibility with a slight transformation uh, to catalyze an, another process of transformation within it. Mm, information then is the tension of form. Uh, it corresponds to the metastability, so that the stored energy of a system that can still be actualized to its potential transformation. Uh, and it is also the critical threshold that triggers the individuation or the singularity, the entity event or whatever uh, that brings about the transformation. So it's this metastability that constitutes what Simondon calls a first information. So the first information is that there is tension, that there is a tension that has the possibility, uh, that harbors the possibility of transformation. And this is not a source of information, but it is the condition of possibility for information. So it's 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 if you like the first in the phases of transformation that we call information is this tension, the metastability, the potential uh, of stored energy that can still actualize itself. So this now brings me to the critical point of comparison with the bounded data sets that I used for the statistical functioning of large language models. So this first information, the tension of form, the condition of possibility, corresponds in the largest sen possible sense to what Simondon defines uh, with the Ionian philosopher Anaximander as the aperon, the unbounded and the indeterminate, from which every individuated being can emerge. So this is a kind of pre-Socratic uh, idea. And I quote Simondon briefly, the Ionian physiologists so the, the philosophers of nature, of pusses of nature, they call them the physiologists, found in nature the origin of all types of being prior to individuation. Nature is this aperon, that without boundary, like the aperon, would remain in the individual like a crystal that retains mother liquor, and this charge of the aperon would allow it to go toward a second individuation. So the reason why, this end of quote, the reason why we can have this uh, stratification of different um, processes of individuation happening alongside each other and sometimes within each other uh, is that the process of individuation never fully exhausts this unboundedness. So you are an individual, you have, you have a shape and form and functions and organs and so forth, lots of things are fully individuated. And yet there is within each individual something that remains uh, not only indeterminate, that can be determined in the future, but also unbounded, not bounded by your shape, form, identity and so forth. Um, so you are more than one in that respect. Um, you are individual, but you are also um, the carrier of this um, unboundedness of the aperon to a certain extent. And when you're no longer the carrier of this unboundedness and indeterminacy, that's when you're completely dead. 
and in, in in a way if you like in bios in, in the biosynosis of what we know as nature as flora and fauna there is no absolute death absolute death perhaps would correspond to an irreversible pollution but in the biosynosis everything that dies becomes uh you know starts the cycle of individuation again um so individuation then including the relative and dependent ontogenesis of mental images is an ontogenesis that is not totally independent it doesn't it is actualized by the human organism but it doesn't depend entirely on organic functions or even on your conscious will it is a relative it is relative to the organism it is relative to society but it is not fully dependent uh, on our volition or on our kind of purely organic functionings. It corresponds to the emergence of a boundary in the unbounded. It corresponds to the genesis then of a, something that is a topology and a chronology, a topochronology that allows us to distinguish an inside and an outside, a before and an after. So every emergence of an individual is this kind of emergence of a topology at the same time as there is a chronology is a process uh, that allows us to distinguish inside and outside before and after. But the crucial idea of tension of form for, of information here implies a tension between what is bounded and what is unbounded. So this is my personal interpretation, um, taking you on a stroll, if you like, on the outer fringes of interpretation of Simondon. For me, this is what makes Simondon important for contemporary readings of uh, philosophy of information and technology. So the crucial idea of tension of form is not just that you constitute a system within which there is tension, but it is that you have a system within which there is tension between the bounded, the individual that emerges, the, on, the, the entity that emerges, and the unbounded. The boundary between them is a relationship rather than just a kind of standalone entity. And this relationship is a form of tension that, that, that holds together the bounded and the unbounded, the peron and the aperon. Without this tension, there is no resonance internal to the system when, within which there is genesis of the individual. There is no genesis and there is no transformation. So now I'm going to come to uh, Denizan's distinction between intelligence and processes of automated optimization. But first I want to come back to the notion of de-differentiation and crisis that precedes metamorphosis in the organism and that precedes invention as the reorganization of the system of mental images or the kind of reinvention of your world of um, a recasting of your world of mental images. So this notion of de-differentiation finds a more critical example in another text uh, that's an, an appendix to the main thesis, uh, individuation in light of notions of form and potential. At the end of this, there is a conference paper that is attached as an appendix called um, Form, Information and Potential. Uh, and here... Simondon gives a really interesting example of de-differentiation. He's not talking about invention and he's not talking about uh, metamorphosis. And yet this idea of de-differentiation plays an absolutely crucial role for his overall philosophy of individuation. The example he gives is from the American psychologist and pediatrician Arnold Gazelle, who talks about embryology, growth and behavioral development. Uh, Gisele became well known uh, for proposing that children all, all go through the same stages of development and the stages always happen in the same sequence, a sequence that is largely influenced by the maturation of the nervous system, uh, but each child goes through them at their own pace. So not every child will be potty trained at the same age, but uh, the order in which the nervous system matures kind of dictates the order in which uh, it goes through these stages, each at their own pace. So Simondon highlights Gazelle's observation of these moments of de-differentiation. So uh, in the development, the child uh, acquires certain adaptive uh, adjustments, 
and then suddenly it loses these adaptations. And the example is a newborn baby will wake up at random times during the night uh, and then progressively fall into a kind of pattern of feeding uh, that works for a little while. And then suddenly there's a crisis, the child wakes up at random hours. Uh, and after this crisis, it wakes up again in patterns, but with greater spaces. So the digestive system has matured, the nervous system has matured. Um, but rather than maturing progressively all the way through, it reaches a kind of threshold, other processes of development catch up. Uh, and in this th in this threshold of saturation of where the body was at a certain moment, you have um, a kind of disadaptation momentarily, a moment of chaos before suddenly things come together again, but at a higher level of adaptation. So, um, Gazelle observes these de-differentiations of already acquired adaptive adjustments, uh, provoking a crisis of self-regulative self fluctuations. So self-regulation goes out of the window for a moment. Uh, this is when the maturation generates new tendencies, but also new demands on the organism, leading to a period of disadaptation. Uh, so... After this disadaptation, the infant restructures its activity suddenly, but on the basis of, in the example given previously, fewer meals, for instance, um, or the child that uh, that can, uh, what's the English word, crawl, suddenly stops crawling, becomes really cranky, and all of a sudden gets up and walks. So buh, buh, buh. the infant that had developed patterns of waking at night suddenly, I quote, wakes at any moment whatsoever and seeks nourishment when it cries. Uh, and then all of a sudden it restructures its activity, but on the basis of fewer meals per day. Uh, the schema is clear, Simon Dor says, alternation of adaptations to the external world and of disadaptations, whereby the disadaptations mark a moment in the search for a new structure, leading to a succession of paths of adaptation, followed again by disadaptation and de-differentiation. So the initially acquired pattern, the initial adaptation seems lost, but in fact, it is reincorporated in the new adaptation, but not in the same form. You could call it the Aufhebung if you're a Hegelian, but Simon Dor uh, it's not always completely clear why, but it's like, it's not a Galen, it's not a dialectic, we're not negating anything. But to me, it sounds like a people. The process of de-differentiation, Simonton argues, serves to reconstitute the system of potentials. So when the uh, metastable system has actualized its energies, it has a lower level of potential. When you de-differentiate things, when you mix things up again, Simon Dorff thinks this is a way of reamping the system's uh, potential to individuate. So it reconstitutes a system of potentials. It, it cranks up uh, the potentials again. What he calls a somewhat, somewhat liquidated elementary schemas, the ones that are lost in disadaptation, are transformed again into a metastable field that can then become structured suddenly around a theme of organization at a higher tension of form, not unlike the crystal that forms in the saturated mother liquor. And uh, also crystals have can have several um, uh, processes of crystallization, several recrystallizations, if you like, of when conditions, temperature, or whatever change. So the other example, now this is where it gets interesting. The other example of de-differentiation that Simon Don gives uh, is uh, really interesting because he talks about pre-revolutionary states. He says, I quote, the pre-revolutionary state is a state of supersaturation. It is one in which an event is right on the verge of taking place, one in which a structure is about to emerge and all it takes for the structural germ to appear and to suddenly restructure the situation, uh, sometimes chance can produce the equivalent of the structural germ. So it waits, it waits for you know a trigger, but anything can be the trigger potentially in a situation that is highly saturated, like the pre-revolutionary state. I think that's very um, telling. Simonon concludes this text in the appendix um, by comparing the process of de-differentiation 
within a social body or within the individual that enters a period of crisis to the alchemical notion in alchemy, the notion of liquefactio or dissolution. Uh, the other word he uses for it is nigrefactio or putrefaction. So this is the stage in the theory of, of alchemy where substances lose their limit and lose their individuality and lose their isolation. And I want you just quickly put a post-it on the word isolation uh, because we'll come back to this idea of isolation in a minute. So the liquefactio, nigrefactio substances lose their limit, lose their individuality, lose their isolation. So this crisis then gives rise cranks up the potential for a new differentiation, a new individuation. This is then called a cauda pavonis by the uh, alchemists, where objects emerge from the confused night, so to speak. And this de this previous phase of de-differentiation, Simondon says, was considered by Jung as a sacrifice, a sacrifice that precedes the return to a state comparable to that of birth. Uh, a return to what Simon calls a richly potentialized and not yet determined state. Comparable to birth. So now we'll conclude slowly uh, and take this idea of a transition from an individual bounded pattern to a crisis that reboots a not yet determined state, but with a higher tension. And we take this back to the idea we started out with, namely the tension and relation between the bounded and the unbounded, the peron and the aperon, between the determinate and the indeterminate, between the individual and the aperon. How does this translate into the question of machine learning? How does it change the question regarding intelligence and learning, uh, regarding models and schematizations of reality and their limits? So this brings me to this article by Yamor Denizan, uh, Intelligence as a Border Activity Between the Modeled and the Unmodeled. And I'm going to uh, later, when we finish, I will put the text in our um, folder so that you have that if you want to look at it. In this pa paper, Denizan distinguishes between human intelligence and its capacity for creative, what she calls ontological expansion. This, and on the other hand, she distinguishes this from the predefined model-based operations of machines. So I'm going to explain these terms now and, and the comparison she makes. In a seminar on the aesthetics of noise and the new frontiers of cognition, which I had organized for a place called the Collège International de Philosophie, uh, Denizan discussed with other participants and together they coined this term automated optimization, automated optimization in, as an alternative for artificial intelligence. So call it AO rather than AI. And I'll now say briefly why I agree with Denizan, uh, not only that this is a good idea, but why it matters. The issue is not merely one of adequate conceptualization of machine learning processes. It matters because what we imagine intelligence to be has, as you will discover when reading Simondon, has a propensive force. It has this, this kind of translation of kinetic energy into tension, which can then be translated back into movement and, and um, something that propels us forward. It propels us in a certain direction, how we imagine things and intelligence in particular. If we take an automated and hence unfree process as the paradigm for intelligence, we will be more likely to forfeit this elusive sliver of freedom that characterizes the intelligence, the biological evolution, and that diverse cultures of humans and other species have brought about through their crises and reorganizations and mental images and schematizations through their revolutions and metamorphoses. So this capacity, if you like, uh, for the indeterminate and to reboot the indeterminate is something that um, I think we jeopardize if we allow as the paradigm for intelligence um, autom the optimization of automated processes. What we imagine intelligence to be feeds into the way that we prob solve the problems that we face as a society. And at this point, I think it's worth pointing out that academia has adopted the term artificial intelligence 
not just that, but also the generous funding that its use elicits without any resistance. So there's critique of the term artificial intelligence. Is it intelligent? Is it not intelligence? But nobody really questions that we should be using this term. Um, I don't want to sound conservative here. I just think that there's something uh, a little bit, um, it's important what words we use. Um, so we should negotiate this rather than just accept it. Because the valence of the term artificial intelligence also obeys strong financial imperatives. And I'll make a very quick digression here. Uh, David Kahn of Sequoia Capital, an American venture capital firm, published a piece in 2023 uh, where he basically uh, highlighted the gap between revenue expectations on the basis of investments that had been made into AI infrastructure and to the building of AI infrastructure, data centers and uh, processes and so forth. So the gap between the investment that had been made and the actual revenue growth in the AI industry. And he called this a $125 billion hole that needs to be filled for each year of CapEx or capital expenditure at today's level, so at the level of 2023. So if every year you had the same level. So he ran a rejoinder to this piece just now, 2024, where he concluded that AI's 200 billion question is now a 600 billion question. And the 125 billion hole is now a 500 billion hole. So that's something to, I don't know if that jogs your imagination, but I think that the pressure that is there to hype um, uh, you know, technical processes that are really truly astounding and, and extraordinary um, as hyper intelligent. I think the pressure is on uh, and as uh, thinkers and creatives, we should not decide what pressures we bow to or not. So the hype around AI, including in academia, uh, in the arts, likewise, I would say has adopted the term artificial intelligence uh, without resistance. Uh, sorry, I jumped to the wrong place. So, it, but it cannot be dissociated from the financial pressure for returns that the investment in the industry generates, uh, the pressure. And it seems to me regrettable if creatives, philosophers, academics can be so easily persuaded to inadvertently bow to the marketing imperative of powerful corporations. So let me now briefly finish with Dinizan's argument before uh, I conclude on the constitutive relation with the unbounded that characterizes individuation for Simondon and the individuation of mental images and its culmination in invention in particular. So that would be relevant to the question whether AI can invent or not. So I'm going to talk quickly about the difference between automated processes and intelligence and living beings. Intelligence is often framed within technological and engineering contexts in terms of efficiency and data processing. For instance, AI systems excel in narrowly defined tasks like chess by relying on brute force computation. So I'm summarizing here Yamor Denizan's argument. I hope well, because she does it super well in her article. Um, and you know, as a non-engineer, I guess there's lots of things you can get wrong. So AI systems excel in narrowly defined tasks, narrow, limited, like chess, uh, by re relying on brute force computation. So chess is not narrow. Uh, if you try to play chess, but it is, uh, it's not, it's one task, let's put it this way. By the human chess, but the human chess or go player, even if she loses against the machine, deploys processes of creativity that leap over the computation, which it cannot process in the same speed as a machine or in the same scope, by adapting to the means at its disposition. So we don't have the same computing means and we leap over those limitations through the use of our imagination or shortcuts, cognitive shortcuts. I'm not sure how uh, chess players do it. Um, this creativity in the play with a relative scarcity of uh, cognitive resources when compared with the computational power, memory and speed of the machine is what characterizes human intelligence. Control theory in engineering, Denizan stresses, is about machines operating within fixed, predefined models. Predefined, determined, limited. These models, so you could say the model is, is um, 
Anyway, I don't want to confuse it too much. These models can adapt to changing inputs, but the adaptation is limited to set parameters. The machine cannot expand the scope of these free parameters beyond the original design. It can't do it by itself. We can do this. The machine can't do it by itself. By th but this is precisely what living beings do and what humans do incidentally by inventing and improving technical schemas, including um, machine learning and large language models. In this context, a model refers to a simplified representation of a system, a reality, that allows for prediction, understanding, or control. So you have a complex reality in front of you, you reduce it to a few parameters that you think matter to understanding and controlling how that system works. For example, if you build a toy car. While both AI and uh, uses, she uses, yeah, while both... Um, Automated optimization processes, or so-called AI, and human cognition use models of reality. The scope and flexibility differs greatly. Machine models have predefined structures with only relatively free, adjustable, but ultimately finite parameters accommodating feedback within set limits. In contrast, cognitive models in humans are dynamic, evolving structures that can grow or reorganize through the interaction with the environment. So this is Sim, Sim, uh, Denizan speaking here. And if you plug it into Simondon, it becomes, um, you know, it, it's, I think it becomes even more relevant and exciting. Models simplify complex systems, encapsulating essential features for specific tasks in AI or uh, optimize. Oh, I can't remember now. Anyway, this in AI, let's I can't I'm not disciplined enough not to call it AI. In AI, these models are limited to the context for which they were designed. Uh, technological systems use models with fixed ontologies. So fixed the ontology here is the model of reality with a finite ability to adapt beyond what has been programmed. Uh, while AI models can adjust certain parameters, they are bound by design and cannot undergo significant change without external intervention. In human cognition, models form part of an evolving knowledge structure referred to by Denizan as an edifice of knowing. Uh, just a, quickly, this pre-adaptations that Simondon speaks of that would inform, for example, our in uh, the instincts with which we uh, react even to objects even before the first time we experience them uh, could be something like the bottom layer of this edifice of knowledge. So the the older they are in evolutionary history, for instance, uh, the more inflexible they are to change. But the most recent additions may adapt more fluidly, accommodating new experiences and expanding the individual's understanding of the world while the oldest strata like instincts are much more inflexible. It doesn't mean you can't change them at all, not necessarily, but um, there are degrees of flexibility. Uh, I think we have only 20 minutes left now. So I'm going to leave the conclusion uh, to next time. I was going to talk about ontological expansion and um, ontological stasis, but I'll start with that next week, I think, um, because I really want to, use the last 20 i actually thought i would have more time but i talked too much so um well hold that hold that thought here bear just keep in the back of your minds the idea of ontological expansion and um how to overcome the ontological stasis of our of the models that um inform automated processes so uh, I, hope he, I, I guess we don't even have time for a break now. Really sorry about that. I thought I would be much quicker, but with the questions in between probably and me talking more, took a little bit longer. Can we go maybe in order of um, uh, a random order? Because I think you all have, uh, the screen appears differently for each of you. Well, I'll, no, I'll just call you up if that's okay. Uh, Manuel? Is that, is, do I um, pronounce your name correctly? Do you want to introduce yourself and maybe say what you bring, what you want to get out of this and what your kind of background is? Hi, can you hear me? Perfect, yeah. It's a 
manual, it's fine. The Italian pronunciation is Magno. Okay. Uh, if you can say, you know, Brazilian way. I'm Brazilian really quickly. I'm Brazilian. I'm a musician. I'm not a philosopher. Um, I I come from the experimental music scene in Rio. I used to play with Jean-Pierre Caron and, you know, I, I know the, the people there very well. I'm doing my PhD. I currently live in Belgium, doing my PhD in a place called the Orpheus Institute. And oh, I love that place. Oh, you know, uh, that's good. So, um, yeah, I'm doing my PhD here in a group uh, that deals with music and technology. And really briefly, I deal with uh, the construction of bespoke instruments. So how the construction of a instrument that is particular to a specific creative process informs the composition process of that piece, unlike working with the affordances of, let's say, a violin, which is a ready-made object that is given for, um, yeah, for a compositional process. Wow, so interesting. Uh, I know I love the um, Orpheus Institute. It's it's like an ivory tower of complete freedom where at, at least that's how I imagine it, where composers and musicians just do. They don't have to answer to anybody in the world and just do their own thing. That's That was my impression when, when I went there. Well, just the Ministry of whatever in Belgium, the, you know, fund, the funding bodies. But other than that, it's kind of like that, yeah. It's quite free, no? Is Paolo Dessi still there? And Paolo Dessi is still there, yes. Okay, then do do say hello to him from me, please. Um, well, lovely, thanks, and uh, very nice to meet you. And I I can see already without you saying explicitly uh, what what brought you to Simon Dans' imagination and invention. So I hope that the the way we put this together is going to be. Um, it'd be really nice actually if you could do your presentation on um how this links up with your practice of uh, of invention of uh, instruments, bespoke instruments. Because yeah, I think I it's in it. a way, in my mind at least, it links up quite well with this idea of ontological expansion. But we, we'll Yeah, get... you only use today words like event, crystallization, bifurcation, a whole bunch of things that are in my thesis. And like, ah, someone said it before. So if you look at that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, lovely. And very nice to meet you, Magno. Um, so, uh, Frida. Yeah, hello, I'm uh, Ardam. I'm, I'm from Morocco. Uh, I work... Uh... Oh, wait, 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 I can't see you. Uh, where, where are you? Ah, yeah, uh, is it Reda who's speaking? Yes. No. Ah, yeah, cool. Go ahead. Uh... As you said, I'm, I'm, I'm from Morocco. I'm a PhD candidate in, uh, in uh, strategic studies. Uh, in what studies? In strategic studies. I come from uh, a background in geopolitics and international relations. So my main interest is, uh, uh, is the question of ident identity, ethnicity, and violence, and its relation to the military apparatus. And I mainly focus on on uh, postcolonial perspectivism and also the the presentations uh, that the different actors build and have on themselves. So it's mainly the image part in geopolitics. So and I think it 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 was the main. Uh, 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 the main lead to Simondon. I didn't know Simondon first. I, I, I know him superficially in L'Ile Deserte de Deleuze, but uh, it's uh, it's the first the first direct read into Simondon. Well, this is uh, very exciting as well. I, I wonder, I, I hope that this introduction um, managed to be kind of coherent enough uh, but I, I would imagine that Simon Don's concept of information and how it links to these topologies of, of uh, mental images oops sorry <laughs> could be interesting also for looking at international relations as a system of tension so what operates as information there and what doesn't and it would be very nice if you want to bring that into your presentation, for example, it would be awesome. I look forward to that. Um, then I have uh, Frida. 
Hi, hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'm Frida. Uh, I'm from Mexico. Uh, I'm in Japan right now, so I'm a bit sleepy. <laughs> Sorry for that. <laughs> um, I'm an artist. Uh, I think uh, you can find my work at the Venice Biennial. I made a very big painting. I'm a painter. So I think I'm very interested in the kind of way of image works, like how this image works, the uh, like the historicity of images, and especially in within painting, obviously, how genealogies work, um, and, and also the idea of the exteriority of the image. I think that was that was like something that really drew me to Simon Don. And well, I mean, you know, I'm not a philosopher. Uh, I'm, I'm not doing a PhD, but I do really think about my work like in philosophical terms, you know? So, um, and I do a lot of lecture performances. So this is kind of my main um, takeaway from the new center in general and this course in particular. No, very nice. Well, I'm so curious to what's the time where you are now? Uh it's like 5 p.m. <laughs> oh, p.m. in the afternoon or no a.m. a.m. in the morning. Oh crikey, that is some very yes. serious motivation. That is a huge yeah. honor for me that someone <laughs> would wake up at this time of um, wow, yeah. that is that's that's great. Um, <laughs> yeah. Well, I I hope it's not going to be too tough for you, uh, you know, following every Saturday. No. But, um... I go I go back to America uh, next week, so okay. I thought, okay, I will do these efforts. So next time, you know, I'm, I'm up to date, and then I can it's... take it in a normal hour. <laughs> It's a huge honor. I really appreciate it. And um, yeah, <laughs> likewise, I um, I think, I don't know if you had a chance already to read the introduction to the imagination and invention, but it starts yes. with this sort of startling um, materialism of images and saying, look, images haunt you and do mm -hmm. all sorts of, they make you do things. And yeah, yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. They exist out there in the world and they evolve according to a... Uh, kind of logic and necessity almost of their own uh, so mm -hmm. the system of tensions isn't uniquely the psychology of the individual that thinks it's also you know the history of images in our culture and the encounter of different cultures and genealogies of images so um, I yeah I would love if you wanted to present also your own work and the questions you ask yourself uh, in relation perhaps even literally to this first part which um, I didn't start with that with the book because I thought that it was important not to uh, overemphasize this because he does then later talk about these kind of innate tendencies and, and before coming back to the wider cultural angle. But it is a very yeah, startling, uh, startling text, I think, the new um, simulacra, simulacral theory of images. No, absolutely. It was very, very inspiring. And really lovely to meet you too. Yeah. Thanks for Thank introducing you. yourself. Uh, uh, Nayam, is that the right word, the way to pronounce your name? I am. Um, no, it's Niev. Niev, of course. I should know actually because I did meet Niev before, but I didn't know how it was written. Okay. Um, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. Um, so I'm um, an artist, a researcher, and curator um, from Ireland. Um, I um, have a background in, um, I studied cultural studies in London and I did a PhD in philosophy at Goldsmiths um, on uh, the diagram in Deleuze and his reading of Leibniz. Um, and I'm really interested, I've been auditing this, um, some of your courses already, um, Cecile, um, because I'm really interested in um, the sort of relationship between, um, I've recently gotten into Châtelet and his theory of the diagram. And of course, oh, the relationship between Châtelet and Simon Don and Deleuze 
Um, and also then well, in relation to shelling, I mean, I had many things. I, I didn't oh, know what wow. to start with speaking about today because there were so many things. My that... alternative life. <laughs> it's it's so uh, annoying that you can't uh, realize all your dreams, but that would be shelling, Chatelet. Um, yeah, yeah. Deleuze, that's because a, um, what you were talking about in terms of the, um, you know, the whole metaphor of, of lightning and uh, to describe sort of the milieu and pre the pre-individual, um is very much you know has something in relation to Schelling's idea of the um the subject in relation to nature you know there's a continuity and a sort of a dynamic and talking about sort of men the, the polarity of the mental you know and the physical um and yeah. then how the diagram really is a sort of a a mechanism for trying to keep that momentum going of that dynamism you know and, yeah, um, so there's, like yeah there's a lot there that really could be quite interesting <clears throat> and the externalization of thought and the process of externalizing thought um and thinking through diagrams to to actually kind of to to, to work with that um so there's a lot there's a lot of resonance really um so yeah i'm really excited about about the course i'm, I'm doing some projects myself um curatorial projects working with diagrams in relation to archives sort of trying to look at um sort of um the kind of complexities difficulties challenges around the sort of local in relation to the archive and then thinking about it on a broader sort of scale not necessarily the universal but you know um trying to extend out from that from the local um uh so yeah um i i believe we we have met cecile many years ago um, i think so <laughs> yeah. too and maybe yeah. you are you yeah. are the person whose name I had never read before. Yes, 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 yes. yes. Uh, I can't did. remember where, but I, th I think so. Yeah, uh, through a good friend of ours, Katie Lloyd-Thomas, um, and probably yes. in, in Middlesex University and various other oh, conferences. Crikey, that and... is a long time ago. Yeah. Well, I was I was in London to do my PhD from... Uh, but you're not in London now, right? Because no, I'm no, no, I'm based in Ireland now. Katie soon. Sorry, okay, but if you do come to London, you let me know because I, yeah. I'm going to meet Katie soon. I haven't seen her again right. for ages, but um, well, do but tell it's her. Really well, nice to meet. Her. I have kind of lost contact with her, so do. But it would be really lovely to reconnect. So please do do tell her I, I'm asking for. I her will. Time. I yeah. will. I promise. Um, there is uh, yeah, Schelling. It's um, I there was a moment when I thought I'm going to do my PhD on Schelling and Simondon, and then I realized that reading Schelling would take me at my pace, uh, like maybe a hundred lifetimes or something like yeah. this. And I, Simon Dye is already, yeah, yeah. Simon Dye is, is quite something <laughs> already, but Schelling is yeah. another level. And yeah. I think for that reason, probably there, uh, as far as I know, nobody's done serious work on Schelling and Simon Dye. And perhaps for the same reason, Simon Dye also didn't have much time for Schelling. But yeah. uh, that's how... Well, I mean, I'd say my focus won't be Schelling so much as Chatelet via, you know, some Deleuze as well. You know, it's kind of yeah, not, yeah. you know... The, the, the genealogy is is there yeah. that way rather than Hegel 100%. And yeah, yeah. it's Chatelet. And I will, when I put the... Um, uh, Yamo Denizan's article in the folder, you'll see that part of the power of her presentation, which I couldn't really um, represent here without it taking too long uh, and without being afraid of getting it wrong, to be honest, uh, although she's so clear, is the power of, of redrawing the diagram that we are all familiar with, which mm -hmm. is uh, noise in the channel of communication. So I actually I can't recommend this article uh, enough are you are you sharing that can can you share that with us yeah or? yeah i'll share it I'll, okay. I'll, yeah i'll put i'll put the article in the folder we we do have a folder right for the syllabus yeah yeah i'm sure we do but, yeah. um, but i i hope you're all reassured you were all reassured to see that you only had to read the book because i think it's much better to feel, come out of this feeling that you've read as much as you could uh it kind of encomp encompass some of the ideas in such a sense that you say i've read this and i've in integrated this rather than reading a panoply of different sure. things oh yeah yeah no, absolutely what not. is relevant you can always add to it but it's, it's not uh essential oh, it's so exciting nice to meet you again after yeah, yeah, absolutely. Really yeah a yeah, lifetime sure. i have to say yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> thank you okay uh so reda i see no jeff please if you could introduce yourself hi um jeff parad i'm a painter as well i'm in massachusetts in the u S and um, yeah, thank you for your explanation before from the paper about the, um, the sort of origins of individuation in the mental image. I mean, it makes a lot of sense to me. I still have questions that I want to explore in a paper. 
on that. But um, I, I work in a process-based uh, genetic mode that includes chance and contingency and um, uh, randomness. And um, I use those as a, as terms in what I think of as a larger logical framework or reasonable framework as modes of, and I've used this term before, imaginative invention, you know, toward toward the new. So um, towards something else. So that's um, that's what I'm here to kind of, I'm here to kind of put that up against um, Simondon and, and see how the two kind of play together and see how I get influenced and how I can influence um, some ideas about Simondon. Um, I wrote a couple of things down. So yeah, what Simondon has to say about art and specifically about how we think about art today. You know, what are the what are the um, social modes of art that are dominant today and um, how what or what might uh, Simondon's critique of those forms be and what it might point to um, is the other part. And I guess more narrowly, so, you know, about chance and um, contingency and, um, you know, how it functions in the processes that he describes. Does he require chance at some point in his in his um, descriptions or his explanations. Um, so these are these are all the questions that I'm, I'm the open questions I'm coming to the seminar with. Yeah, very interesting. Um, similarly, I come from uh, working on the relationship between information uh, and noise, um, kind of phrased by Shannon as a question of freedom of choice, and. I used to be a little bit frustrated with Simondon that uh, I I couldn't think noise as a kind of generative um, thing in his framework so much until I found this thing of de-differentiation, but I hadn't really read at the time imagination and invention. So I, I thought, oh, there's this thing in the appendix and right at the, at the end of this impossible text, uh, there's this thing about de-differentiation and then it ends in alchemy. And you're like, what am I going to do with this? And then you realize yeah. reading imagination and invention just how fundamental it is. It's interesting that he leaves it out when he says it's the three cycles. But yeah. without the differentiation, you don't get to the reinitiation of the cycles. But it's it's something he's he knows, and at the same time, it seems to sometimes fall off the off the wagon a little yeah. bit. For art, I give you a, a hardcore spoiler alert. I think Simona had didn't have the faintest clue about the art that was contemporary to him. He was very well informed about science and technology. It looked to me not only disinterested, but a little bit hostile uh, to the arts, mm -hmm. which is a, such a shame. Um, the examples he gives are really anachronistic in a way. Um, but nevertheless, some of his criticisms of aestheticization are things that I think uh, could be, I, I'm not sure really that's the most in, interesting way to read Simondon. I think you probably just have to take him and, and run with it and do your own thing. Do your own reading of actual contemporary artistic processes yeah, using the framework exactly of the situation I, exactly rather than his own um, yeah, understanding of, of the arts, which um, he has a few in other texts, a few funny things to say about fashion. Um, not just funny, uh, actually quite interesting you can piece things together but really he doesn't i don't think he has um i think there's a big thing lacking that he didn't have an interest in the arts that were contemporary to him mm, so that might be an area itself. a building that's site interesting in itself to, to, be, be, yeah. to be continued it's, it's yeah. my personal reading so you know other people might see this differently but um yeah, yeah thanks and very nice to meet you um I, uh lynn oh it is um I think we're at the end of our session. One thing, I, perhaps we can do one more. I just go two, three minutes over. And I realize also for um, uh, Frida, it's probably if you can still get some sleep before you have to get up later, we'll, we'll let you go back. But I, do, I don't want to end too abruptly. So maybe we'll do one more introduction and then uh, we continue next session uh, with introductions so that we know 100% we have enough time for everyone to say um introduce themselves properly if that's okay um lena do you want to go next i've written everyone's names down so um i i know that nobody's going to you know be forgotten hi there i hope i was meant yes yeah um 
so I'm Lena. I'm currently calling you from the north of England and I'm actually a new student on the certificate program, which is very exciting. Um, and I just completed a master's in a course called philosophy and AI. Okay. Um, and for Oh, my I hope I didn't say anything too silly. I think we agree on many things um, concerning the term AI. Um, and I read um, a bit of Simon Don for my dissertation project, um, but more on um, his concept of technological individuation. I was kind of very ignorant of um, the other forms of individuation that he's written about. Um, but it was good to see the parallels there. Um, so yeah, I'm just excited to continue reading Simon Dahl. Awesome. Yeah, very nice. Um, the thing with AI and, um, oh, you know, optimized automation. Of, now I'm too, I'm also a little bit tired. It's a bit tired, late where, where I am. It's, well, mind you, it's 9.30. It's past my shelf life for cognitive labor. Um, but this the thing, in a way, to, to a certain extent, um, unless you are yourself a programmer or you're really involved with these processes, it's always a bit risky for someone like myself to, have a kind of distant approach at the same time we all have a responsibility to to chip in with our varying degrees of um ignorance so don't take my word for anything uh check things out yourself but uh, i think it, i'm just kind of uh, relying on um the knowledge and authority of the of other people i quote and trying to piece things together in a uh, responsible way yeah but it's uh, it's awesome if some of you bring actual experience and knowledge uh, from this sector into the discussion. So very cool. I wish we could continue with the introductions. Um, but uh, yeah, I think uh, Frida probably needs to get a chance to have a little bit of a rest before this day starts for you. Uh, and uh, for me too, I've got people waiting for me in the background and some of you may have to leave. So We'll probably call it a day for today and continue the introductions uh, next week in the beginning of the session. Uh, and then uh, we delve in uh, with a little bit more of a close reading of the chapter that you read for this week. So you can reread the introduction and reread the first part so that you're a bit familiar with them. And then we'll uh, we'll basically move through the text and, and discuss it. But uh, yeah, lovely to meet all of you and especially to hear from those who got a chance to introduce themselves and I look forward to hearing from everybody else next week. Is it? Yes, next week, right? Yeah. No, wait. Are we meeting next week? No, in two weeks, right? Because I'm traveling next week. Anyway, next session. Good. Um, lovely. Thanks for joining everyone and, and see you at the next session. Thank you. Peace. Thanks, Cecile. Ciao. Bye.